please join me in welcoming Tom Paulkin. Happy to have you, Tom. Thank you. Come on up. Good to see you. Thank you for making the time to be here. Good to be here, Evan. Why do you want to be governor of Texas? <clears throat> well, there are a lot of serious issues that need to be addressed, and I think we've got a top-down style of leadership that is ill-suited for the future of Texas. Simple as that? It's simple as that. Uh, I, I got involved as chairman of the Texas Workforce Commission on fixing a broken public educational system, which was right. a top-down system. Uh, it took four years of uh, real battles, but uh, we finally have busted, uh, in a sense, a cartel that was uh, uh, not liked by the parents, by the students, uh, by the teachers, and by the business communities. And we've gone back towards uh, really beginning to undo this uh, centralization of education at the national yeah. and state level, uh, more emphasis on vocational education. Uh, but there's so many other issues that we've got to address as a state, and I'm kind of tired of the sound bites uh, rather than the sound policies that we need. And, yeah. and I don't think we have policies based on our conservative principles, and if we don't get it right, we're going to wake up uh, those of us who have been involved in the conservative movement a long time with a nasty surprise, and it could come sooner rather than later. So this is not, you talk about a top-down problem, this is not a style issue, this really is a substantive issue. You have substantive differences both with the current governor, Rick Perry, and with the front runner on the Republican side, Greg Abbott. Uh, Greg, and I, Greg Abbott and I have uh, many substantive differences. Uh, the most recent being his support with Eric Holder uh, to block the merger of American Airlines and U.S. Air. I mean, right. that's a job killer for Texas. Yeah. I don't know why he's doing it. It's an example of a big government Republican. Uh, his support for this uh, 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 screwy school finance system that we've yeah. got, the Robin Hood school finance system. We've got to find a better way to fund the property poor districts than. Uh, uh, taking money from local school districts and redistributing it elsewhere. Uh, term limits, I support him, he opposes him. And crony capitalism, I mean, this is a guy, I mean, he's on the board, he's appointed to the board of the Cancer Fund, which gives out $300 million a year uh, to be, quote, a watchdog, according to one legislator. He doesn't attend a meeting for three years and he gets uh, $3 million in contributions. Uh, that's crony capitalism, and that's got to stop. That's, uh, it's infected both parties. It's not good for Texas. It's not good for American politics. I want to get into each of the issues you just mentioned in a second. Let me ask about your uh, a candidacy, though, and specifically right. why you think your particular set of experiences uh, qualify you to be governor. Should, really, are there any qualifications that would be up to that job? Or, well, or are we in a at a time now where somebody who's not necessarily held elective office before isn't disqualified for elective well, office? Well, you know, look, I've been, in, I've been involved in models that worked. I worked in the Reagan administration where we were serious about solving problems based on our conservative principles, ran a federal agency for the president, uh, chaired the Republican Party when we were the minority party, helped turn it into a majority party, but we built it from the grassroots up. Yeah. Uh, I chaired the Texas Workforce Commission. Uh, per se, it wasn't in my purview to do something about vocational education, but everywhere I went in Texas, uh, employers kept telling me the same thing. Tom, we're choking off the pipeline of skilled workers. We've got this top-down teaching to the test system. Yeah. We've got to bust it up, and I led the effort to do that, and we put a bipartisan approach to, together. I mean, you've got to work together, but you do it based on sound ideas, and we've got to reach beyond our base mm -hmm. and uh, quit just getting away with thinking because you got a ton of money. Uh, look, as I get around the state, it's not that uh, people tell me, gee, we love Greg Abbott. Oh, but he has so much money, Tom. Uh, and that's the issue. So you think people are more taken by the inevitability, real or imagined, of Mr. Abbott's candidacy more than anything substantive about it? No, him? I don't see anything. Yeah. Look, if I thought he were a serious conservative and a serious about policy issues, I wouldn't be running. You don't believe Greg Abbott is a serious conservative? That would be news to a lot of people in this state. Well, he's reading a script. I mean, it's like this recent... Who's writing uh, the script he's reading? I don't know. Ask Dave Carney. He's running this campaign. But uh, he's reading a script. I mean, it's not from the heart. It's not a conservatism from the heart. It's uh, like taking sound bites. It's like saying, hey, this is a big deal. I came out for the, uh, for the Ten Commandments. Now, who's going to be against the Ten Commandments on the Republican and conservative side? Or I sue Obama, except when he woke up one morning to decide to join with Obama in the suit against American yeah. Airlines. Uh, it's more a standpoint of publicity and rhetoric. It's almost a fraud, if you will. I mean, he's very good at raising money. I mean, he spends tons of time raising money. Uh, but in terms of substantive ideas, I mean, where's the beef? 
Uh, he's not talking about education. He's not talking about transportation or water. These are all serious issues. He just says they're serious problems. Well, that's, you know, that's nice rhetoric, but it doesn't address the issue. You, you've mentioned his money today. You've mentioned many sure. times uh, to, to newspapers around the state you've visited and in sure. appearances you've made around the state. He's a $25 million man. The sure. money doesn't necessarily mean anything. But you acknowledge that in right. politics, while it's not everything, money does matter. Sure. It's something. He has much more money than you do, right. according to the last campaign financial reports. Let's acknowledge he will have more money than you in this race by some sure. significant magnitude. Okay. He's run for statewide office twice as Supreme Court judge, uh, uh, justice successfully, attorney general three times successfully. Uh, his name ID is probably higher in Texas, right. let's acknowledge, than you are. And again, there's this idea of inevitability. The press has probably been complicit in this in saying, well, Greg Abbott is the likely Republican <laughs> nominee. I would agree with you on that. Right. So, so those are the realities of sure. the situation. How do you run smack into that well, and hope to be successful? But, I'm sorry to talk process no, before no, no, substance, no. but how do you run smack no, into that but, and but, give anybody hope you can win? Evan, he hasn't had a race. He hasn't been vetted. I mean, look, he was appointed to the district bench in Harris County. I don't think he'd even voted before he was appointed a Republican district judge. Then he's moved up the ladder to the Supreme Court and then moved up the ladder when John Cornyn was moved up from Attorney General to uh, the Senate. He's never had a race. And in fact, they basically told me people uh, well, Kirk close to the Kirk process. Watson may, Kirk Watson might take a little issue with that. Well, but that's, you know, that's at a time when the Republicans, it was an inevitability of a, of a Republican. You're victory. really talking about in the Republican primary. I'm talking primary. about in the Republican primary. Right. He's <clears throat> never had a race. This is his first race. And he's going to have a serious race uh, in the general election if Wendy Davis gets in the race. And I look, I disagree with her philosophically, but she is a smart lady, not a stupid lady, as one of... Uh, of uh, his uh, top advisors called her the other day, and she's uh, got a lot of determined people, and so I don't underestimate uh, uh, this, uh, this November race. And I think I'll be a much better candidate uh, running against Wendy Davis than Greg Abbott. If, if you were not running chairman, would you be comfortable supporting General Abbott, or would you not be a supporter of his in the absence of your own candidate? I, I, well, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with the direction of the Republican Party in the post-Reagan period, this top-down, big money, special interest, crony capitalism approach. Uh, I think it's a broken system. Uh, there's too many of these uh, uh, folks that are listening to the folks that write the $100,000 checks and there are not enough people listening to the grassroots folks that are out there, the middle class taxpayers right. who feel frustrated and forgotten. And, uh, and we better start changing and getting back to our roots if we hope to uh, not only uh, stay uh, a Republican in Texas, but also have Texas lead the nation back in the direction I would like to see it to go. So you could not support Greg Abbott? I didn't say that. Yeah. I just said I am not comfortable with the crowd running things, and I think ultimately they will bring us all down, yeah. whether it's this time or four years from now. If you keep doing what you're doing, it's a broken system. And I said the same thing. We saw it with the Bush presidency morphing into the Obama presidency. And you could see it happening. And we've lost the coalition. We've got to figure out how to put the economic and social conservatives back together. We've got to build from the grassroots up. Yeah. And we have to be a policy-driven party, not a poll-driven conservative party from the top down. And that's what we've got today. And let's be frank about it. Let's get into the policy. <clears throat> Uh, aspects of your candidacy. You alluded earlier to the differences between sure. you and General mm -hmm. Abbott on education. You believe, if I understand it correctly, that the Robin Hood system, the recapture system, is broken. Absolutely. You want to eliminate that. You want to replace it with a modest increase in the sales tax to replace the money that is currently being generated through the system. Yes, you've got to talk, have Talk a, that through specifically. Okay. You've got $1.1 billion right now that is taken from 374 uh, so-called property-rich districts and redistributed uh, to the so-called property poor districts. You obviously, I, I don't like it in principle because it's taking lows, local school property taxes away from some districts. I believe local school property taxes should stay local. Yeah. I also believe it is unconstitutional because our state constitution says you can't have a statewide property tax. That's what this is. But you've got to have a steady uh, source of revenue for the property poor districts. And I think a better way to fund the property poor districts is through a quarter percent uh, increase in the state sales tax, which will get you 
uh, $1.1 billion, but also is a fairer and more equitable way of funding education. I mean, and, and this is the time to get something done. I was with the superintendent not too long ago who had been a superintendent of a property poor district, and suddenly there's an energy find uh, down in South Texas, Eagle for Shale, and now they're a property rich district. His and, perspective And changed. his perspective has changed quite a bit. But you've right. got to put people in a room together, and you've got to not only address the Robin Hood School finance right. system, but you've also got to address the disparity, certain districts that are comparable to other districts, and yet some districts get more per pupil than other districts. You, so, un you understand that General yeah. Abbott and the people who support him and oppose you, all they're going to hear from that soundbite is blah, 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 tax increase, blah, blah. No, they're not, not going to want to hear about revenue neutral. They're going to say, Tom Plotkin is advocating for a sales tax increase. No, I'm, I'm, I'm advocating for lower property taxes. And if they're, and well, that's how, you, that's, how you, that's how you say it, but you are also advocating for an no, increase in No, but it's revenue taxes. neutral. Yeah. I mean, you've got to find money to, to if you're going to lower property taxes, where do you make up the difference? And you make up the difference with the slight increase in the sales the tax. The last time I heard I think about it's a, better. Yeah. I think it's better to use consumption taxes than property, property taxes. taxes. I think it's a fairer system. Last time I heard about a swap out to, to, to help the tax system was the margins tax. How'd that work out for us? It didn't work out. Yeah. Didn't you support it out. at the time? I did at the time, but I sure uh, have reservations about it now, and it needs to be phased But you out know, Chairman, replaced. over the last two sessions, when people in the legislature talked about the possibility of tweaking, that was the word they used, the euphemism, right. the margins tax, you actually had people on the right say you can't change the margins tax the way it's being discussed because it would represent a tax increase. Some people's taxes would well, go you, up as a result. You've got to phase it out and find a fairer way to, to, yeah. to provide funding. You, you said that uh, uh, you disagree with the general, General Abbott, the, about the constitutionality of the school finance system. He obviously defended the state yeah, he's in, the, in the school finance lawsuit that as of at least right now sits back with Judge Dietz. We thought he might uh, change his decision on the sure. basis of what happened during the session, but I gather after the end of last week he's, he hasn't. This thing is going to proceed. State right. is appealing. Would you have uh, directed your attorney general as governor, or would you have suggested that the state take a different position when the school districts came forward to sue? Well, look, that's where you have political courage to say this is an unconstitutional statewide property tax, which is what it is. Yeah. And you would have said, we've got to fix it. Yeah. Where are you going to come up with the money? I mean, again, well, the, what, what, Judge, what Judge Dietz is talking about, though, in that system, if you believe this is unconstitutional, let's go there. What he's talking about is not simply taking a billion one well, down and a billion one up. He's look, talking about the possibility of needing at least $10 billion well, that, I, I to don't, go in per billion. I don't agree with him on that, but yeah. the point is you can fix this, and I, uh, you can fix it by getting rid of Robin Hood and providing a steady source of revenue to the property poor districts, an alternative approach. Yeah. You believe we're putting enough money into public education. Before the session, I believe Governor Perry's exact word was phenomenal to well, describe the amount of funding into public education for the last 10 years? It's, uh, it's not a question of money. I, I'll tell you one way to find some money is to get rid of that $450 million uh, contract uh, that Pearson has to teach to the test. And I'd eliminate that and go to ACT, ACT, SAT right. for high schools. I'd go to Stanford and Iowa a diagnostic testing uh, for grade schools. So you were a big a advocate for undoing the testing system before Absolutely. the session, and you kind of got what you wanted. Well, we did, and uh, my opponent, uh, one of his largest contributors, is a firm, uh, Aiken & Gump, that's given him hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they've got a stake in this uh, system. And this is the, there's too much of a pay-to-play atmosphere down there, and Greg Abbott's right in the middle of it. Let's talk about this crony capitalism charge. We heard a lot about this when Senator Hutchison ran against Governor Perry in 06. She claimed that one of the knocks against Governor Perry was he appointed all of his friends and campaign contributors to high office. Isn't this ever thus with politics? Are you saying, Chairman Plotkin, that you would appoint your enemies to positions? No, no, no. It's cr Look, yeah, you, you, it's cronyism, though. It is a pay-to-play atmosphere that's down here, and you've got to find quality people who are out there, and there are plenty of quality people. Look at the recent appointments to the Water Development Board. There's only one person on that three-member board that's got any real knowledge of water. You're referring too to Mr. Much, Mr. Rubenstein. Right, and there's too much cronyism. There's no representation for West Texas, rural and ranch interests and I've told them we're going to have a balanced board and I'm going to put three people on there who have knowledge about this issue and who understand it and what we need to do from a long-term basis. Uh, you know, you've got this whole transportation mess that we're in and, uh, and this business SH-130, which Moody's just said recently is uh, 
has got some real problems in terms of their bond review. And the taxpayers are on the hook for $400 million plus for a public-private venture involving a foreign company and a joint venture. I mean, and, and Greg that's Abbott, probably, and that's Greg probably Abbott, capitalism, exactly. Absolutely, and Greg <laughs> Abbott rubber stamped it, and it needs to go. It won't happen with me. You got to sweep the stables out. Yeah. And I don't. And, and this cancer fund is outrageous. What has happened with all these questionable grants, and for the guy not to give back the four million dollars he's gotten from people that benefited from the cancer grants, and refuse to even answer any questions from the media. He refers it to some spokesman. I mean, this is. This is not, uh, you know, have him up here, have him, I'll be happy to debate him at any point on any of these issues. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. So are you, are you saying, Chairman, that you're not, if you're elected governor, you will not appoint donors to positions of No, I'm of saying I'll appoint people that have knowledge about what is, uh, what needs to be done. I'm not going to appoint somebody just because they've given $100,000. Yeah. And there's too much of that cronyism that takes place, and it's, it's, it's kind of, I call it LBJ republicanism. You know, I still remember being in Vietnam and coming into a clearing out in the Delta and there's a brown and root sign. I mean, uh, now it's Halliburton. But there's too much of that stuff that's gone on for too long a period of time. It happened with LBJ and it's happened right now with Greg Abbott and it needs to stop. You mentioned crony capitalism earlier as one area in which you differ with General Abbott. You also mentioned term limits. Right. And you mentioned the American Airlines sure. merger. The, the merger is interesting because, as you say, here he is rarely, after suing the federal government more than any other state attorney general, here he is in, in league, at least for the moment, with, uh, with the Justice Department. Well, and the outrageous aspect of it is the merger was about to close. It's just been approved by the right. bankruptcy court. And two days before the merger was to close, people had already moved from Arizona. In fact, jobs were moving to right. Texas. Uh, he files this lawsuit. And then he changes his rationalization for why he filed it. Now, why didn't he object to the Continental United merger? And neither Abbott nor Holder objected to that. Texas jobs went from Houston to Chicago. No objection from Greg Abbott. And by the way, I think he got a contribution from somebody on the board of 100000 a few months before that happened. Do you I think mean, he has sued the federal government the right amount? You, know, he, he, you have both people who say, we don't like the federal government, we don't like the president. We want to push back against what they want to do, whether it's on the EPA or health care. And the attorney general has, as he said, you know, I get up in the morning, I go in the office, I sue well, the federal government. You have a problem with that? Well, look, I, I think it's more for publicity. I think you've got to figure out how to outsmart what these folks are doing to us in Washington. Some of the suits are fine. Some of them are questionable. But I think it's more for show. Tell me which ones are questionable. Which ones would you, if you had, you know, you ran for attorney general some time ago. You wanted that job. You understand what's required in that job. Tell well, me that which a long suits time that he. Ago. But, well, but I'll it, give you. I'll give tell me you. Well, something I'll you don't give agree you. Uh, I, I would have pushed. There was an. Uh, I, I'll give you an example of one that I would have pushed to do something about. That actually, there was an endangered species uh, lawsuit which almost made it to the Supreme Court. A private attorney had uh, had filed it. I would have tried to figure figure out a strategy about how to take them on on cases that we, we could win. We had a great Tenth Amendment case, this had nothing to do with Greg Abbott, to try to get our unemployment insurance after the feds had refused to give it to us. Uh, I had a brilliant uh, uh, constitutional lawyer lined up to take that lawsuit on, if the Obama did, administration right. didn't give us the money. Uh, the governor, happen. for whatever reason, decided to take a sound bite rather than to uh, uh, go forward. But th these are things that didn't happen. You well, said that there were some lawsuits he filed that you said were questionable. Give me an example of one. Well, I would say, I, I, I would talk about some lawsuits here in Texas, if I may, that, that uh, where I disagree with them. In well, terms but again, of the, I'm, Mr. Puckett, respectfully, okay. I'm asking, you said there are lawsuits he filed against the federal government that you that well, I would say Is there I, an example? I, I don't have one specific right now. Yeah. But I've looked at some, and I'll, I'll get back, but I, I don't have one today. Let me ask you about his handling of the portfolio of, of, of cases, voter ID, redistricting, right. Voting sure. Rights Act, all that stuff. Uh, as my colleague Ross Ramsey and others have written, General mm -hmm. Abbott's record on some of those cases has not exactly been. Well, there's uh, a there's a good example terrific. of tell, what. Tell me about okay. that. Number one, uh, why didn't Greg Abbott, when we had a Republican president, a Republican-controlled Senate and House in 2005, and when Congress was considering putting Texas under the Voting Rights Act for another 25 years, why didn't he uh, go to Washington and say, "Don't extend the law." Uh, he didn't do anything about that. Secondly, I think they badly mishandled the voting rights case down in San Antonio. 
Uh, they've got an intentional finding of discrimination against them in the D.C. Court of Appeals. That case is still sitting out there. It was poorly handled in San Antonio by accounts of people that I know who attended that hearing. And it's, uh, we're just not being effective, it seems to me, in taking the fight to the left on the legal front and on the political front. Do you agree that uh, Texas should have a voter ID system? In Absolutely. Place? Whether or not you like how General Absolutely. Abbott and the Absolutely. state handle it, you think Absolutely. so, you're for voter ID. Do you believe that the redistricting process as it's currently playing out is the right process for Texas, or do we need, do we well, need to do it differently? I think that, uh, I, I think that uh, unfortunately, the Attorney General didn't work closely enough with the legislature to address that redistricting issue properly, uh, and it still allows us to be stuck in court. But no, I'm, I'm comfortable with uh, uh, the existing system. And you don't believe that the, the, the byproduct of the existing system as it was found to be discriminatory, you do? No, I don't believe it. I, I, again, I think there's certain things you've got to do, yeah. and I don't think the, you've got to be proactive rather than being reactive. The Attorney General's office wasn't involved. If you see things, it could be red flags ahead right. of time. You've got to deal with them. They didn't deal with them. But of course, time. Mr. Parker, you're not running for attorney general. You're running right. for governor. And while part That's of right. this is that you're you have a case to make against Greg Abbott, you also want a job that Rick Perry had. Sure. Theoretically, as governor, you own this whole portfolio of issues as much as, if not more than, the attorney general. So tell me what you would have done rather than what you wouldn't have done. Well, what I would have done is work with the legislature. I mean, also the, uh, there were political aspects that came into that. I'd work with the legislature on trying to find a uh, redistricting system that didn't allow uh, uh, the court, uh, that kind of decision to crop up, and I think there are ways that you could have done that. you think the legislature would have worked with you? Sure. I, I've worked with the legislature on a bunch of issues, the education issue and other issues. I've had a good working relationship with the legislature, and I expect that I would have that as governor. So if you get past Greg Abbott in this race, you, you probably, we don't know yet, right. KERA is reporting it maybe as soon as this week we'll have an answer from Senator Davis mm -hmm. on her plan. So let's assume that she runs. Mm -hmm. You've said you think she's smart and, and not stupid, as right. was tweeted out by, um, by one of his uh, political associates. Um, tell me how you run against her. What, is the, what, is the, the, what would be the pocket strategy for combating Senator Davis in the fall? Well, number one, it'll be an issue-driven campaign. You're not going to get into all these kind of personal attacks. So no which, abortion Barbie, no retard Barbie, no, well, no too no. stupid to run, no, none of that stuff. No, none of that. But at the same time, the abortion issue clearly is a, is a key issue. That's an me. issue on which you and General Abbott agree. You're both very much pro Well, but yeah, let me say, watch Greg Abbott and see if he's uh, going to switch uh, as soon as the primary is over, if he gets the nomination. Switch to what? Uh, to the exceptions. Uh, he, has, he's, he, he was actually against exceptions before being against um, exceptions uh, was cool. Look at, la, look at the last two interviews he's had with Christy Hoppe and with uh, Peggy Fikak. He's declining to answer that question. So you think he may actually I move back the, to the I Senate? I think the handlers will uh, encourage him to add additional you exceptions. You are against exemptions for rape and incest? I am, uh, I am opposed to taking the life of the unborn child uh, except in the cases, uh, case of the life of the mother. So no and rape as bad, as bad as that situation is, you have to work with the woman and you cannot have the right to take the life of the child. So no rape, no incest. Right, I, and, and you have no, and you will not move one, I will not, I'm, one I'm centimeter on that issue. No, no, it's, I've been, I, look, I was pro-life after Ray, Roe v. Wade before it was in fashion to be pro-life. As party chairman, I was pro-life and moved the Republican Party to a pro-life position. I'm not going to change my views, but I anticipate Greg Abbott will change his views so after it, the primary. So issue-driven campaign against Senator Davis. Right. Abortion would be one thing. What, what else would you use well, I as think fodder uh, for such a reason? I think education. I have a strong record on education. I'm a Vietnam veteran. Uh, she's talking about what she does for veterans. I think I have a fine record on veterans. I put together the Texas Veterans Leadership Program as chairman of the Workforce Commission. Uh, I think there's a clear distinction between us on economic policy and the role of government, and I think clearly she's identified with centralizing power and support for uh, more of the Obama administration positions, and I believe you've got to figure out a way how do we uh, return to uh, uh, governing our state and not letting the federal government constantly encroach on our powers. So this, this ends up finally, if you get past General Abbott, as a traditional RD race in the fall, Republican yeah, versus Democrat. I think it's conservative versus liberal. Versus liberal. You run yeah. against her as, as a liberal. Has Rick Perry been a good governor? You want to succeed him. He's been the longest serving governor. It's hard to remember what we had before him, actually. You know, it's been so long, right? Was, has he been a good governor? He's done some good things. Has he been a good governor? He's done some good things. No, 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 no. 
No, no, look, Has I, he been I a wouldn't good be, look, I, I think, um, I don't think he's seriously addressed from a conservative perspective the problems facing our state. I think he's kicked them down the road when you got transportation debt of $13 billion. Uh, what you're doing is you're saying you're not raising taxes, but debt is not equity, Evan. And, uh, and we've got, you add the interest to that, it's over $30 billion. So what, so what would be Governor Pawkins alternate strategy for funding transportation? What you do, the first thing you do is uh, do what Senator Nichols and Senator Paxton tried to do this last legislative session. You put all of the money that ought to go to transportation infrastructure in transportation infrastructure. Ending Don't divert it. Ending diversion. What do you do about the money that you take well, away from other programs? It. You've got to find it. And where do you find it? Well, what you do is have akin to what we did in the Reagan administration. I think I'm pretty good good at uh, knowing what's uh, 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 good spending, what isn't. I mean, I cut a budget of the agency I ran by 25 percent and cut the bureaucracy in half. You've got to have something akin to what we had with the Grace Commission, where you bring a group of outside business and civic leaders together, take a look at state spending, identify what are essential services, non-essential services. I'd eliminate the Emerging Technology Fund from day one. Yeah, that's, that's not going to get you right very there. much. Not going to get you no, very no, much. No, no, I know, but there's a lot of areas where I think you can find. The so the so the idea is cut to get money for transportation. But ultimately, you can't say specifically. You don't. You don't come to the table well, today come, with specific programs. Well, you look, you've got emerging tech, uh, technology fund. That's uh, that's fifty million right there that is gone day one. If I'm right. elected, you're picking winners and losers. We shouldn't be in the business of running a public. Fifth, but you know, fund. Chairman, fifty million won't get you a road from Austin to. No, no I concur. I concur with yeah. that. But there are plenty of other areas as well that you have to take a look at. But you're, you know, you can. Uh, in my estimation. You've got to uh, put the money uh, in for transportation infrastructure. At what point did you sour on Governor Perry? Back in 06, <clears throat> you actually were one of the Republicans who stayed firm in supporting Governor Perry against Senator Hutchison. Governor well, Perry appointed you to the Workforce Commission. You took that job. You didn't say, well, I don't agree with you on stuff. I'm well, going to take it. Evan, I, I was asked to come in. I didn't ask to come in. It doesn't right. mean I well, agree with him no. on everything. Well, I could have, but I thought... He, he told me he was serious about wanting to rebuild a conservative majority, right. put the economic and social conservatives back together and get things done. Right. Uh, I, uh, I got in and looked under the hood. It's sort of like looking under the hood of Greg Abbott's operation, and the rhetoric is great, but the reality is very different. I think that I broke with uh, Rick Perry when we were putting together an effort to get the unemployment insurance without strings attached. We had legislation drafted. It would have been very effective. It would have put the Obama administration in a very difficult position. And if they refused to agree with us, we had a great Tenth Amendment case. And the governor decided to take a sound bite rather than a sound policy approach. And that's when I basically said, uh, uh, this is not serious conservatism. And I stayed out of the presidential race. I know Greg Abbott was very active in supporting uh, Rick Perry. I didn't endorse anyone else out of respect uh, for the fact that I was still still chairman at the time of the Workforce Commission, but I stayed out but of that. But the fact race. that you didn't endorse him is a statement in itself. Yeah, uh, but I just felt that uh, these folks are not serious. They're they're not serious about uh, sound policy based based on our conservative principles. And Kevin Eltife, uh, who's a state senator, says the same thing. I mean, about not about Perry per se, but look, we're in charge of governance, and we better address yeah. these issues. I can't say today that I've got a specific fix on transportation, but I right. know the direction we want to move in, and then we've got to figure out how do we find the resources for the money that's been diverted, and what do we do about that? But we're not addressing these issues. I mean, education was another issue. I was surprised that we had this top-down system run effectively by a liberal Democrat, Sandy Kress, which was uh, not See, working for the Sandy kids. Sandy Kress is, is a liberal Democrat. Did I miss that? Yeah, he was. Well, he was. He hasn't well, been now for quite he morphed, some time. Well, he morphs into whatever it takes to, in order to continue his policy uh, control well, over but, education in Texas. Look, he was Dallas County Democratic chairman when I was working how to long advance ago was the conservative. That was a while back. Right. Sandy's no conservative. He's, a liber he's an, a liberal elitist, and he's running our education system in Texas, and it isn't working. And we began to bust it up, and the reality is, by busting it up, ultimately, I think we can move at the federal level to br getting rid of this incredible federal control over education, which he helped put in place with the Bush-Kennedy No Child Left Behind 
bill. And the Obama administration with Common Core has taken it a step further. We need to return control over education to the states and the local communities. And we began to undo it this session here in Texas, and we need to continue to undo it, and I will as governor of the state of Texas, and get back to local control of education and let our public school folks at the local level run their schools. Let me ask you one last thing about politics before we open okay. it up to the audience. You are a former chair of the Republican right. Party. You've said a couple times we have to unite the economic and the social conservatives. Your party, maybe not so much in Texas, certainly nationally, is, is kind of at war with itself. There seems to be a real rift between the two, if there are only two, wings of, right. of the party. Uh, here in Texas, we saw during the legislative session a core group of, of Tea Party, mostly freshmen, members of the House, uh, at, at op in opposition to some of what was coming from the leadership in the, in the House. Uh, there were always questions about whether the leadership and the person of the lieutenant governor in the Senate is adequately conservative given the ideological makeup of the state. Can you talk about that? Can you talk about whether you believe <clears throat> the legislative leadership is as conservative as the base? Well, and how do you bring the party together? Well, uh, you've got a fractured Republican Party, and that's what happens when you have a party that's not grounded on ideas. And when you have policy, good sound policy ideas, I believe in a hand up, not a hand out, which is what our emphasis on vocational education was all about, saving a lot of kids that would have dropped out of school. Guess what happens? You get the Republicans together and you bring along a number of Democrats as well. So I think by having sound policies based on our conservative principles, you can pull the different factions together. And that's what, that's what we did recently. That's what we did in the Reagan but, administration. But you, don't, you don't think, Mr. Chairman, that the issue of spending this session, which is just one example where you had conservatives saying basically we're spending too much money even under the, the, what are traditionally but, austere circumstances in a legislature, you had other people saying, well, we actually have to invest in the infrastructure but, of the state. That but, becomes but, the big divide. But Evan, no, it yeah. doesn't, because what happens is there's no policy direction coming out of the governor's office. And I saw it firsthand. Yeah. In the governor's office under Tom Paulkin, you're going to have policy uh, proposals on water, transportation, on education, on other issues. It doesn't mean they're going to get through, but we'll do what we did on education. We put a policy Pro, a proposal together in the fall before the legislative session. Mm -hmm. And we had plan A, plan B, and plan C, and yeah. we held a, a pretty unwieldy coalition together. You get people in that room and start talking about other issues, there'd probably be disagreements, but on the issues we were able to bring together Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, and moderates as well. Okay. So we can do that on other issues, but you have gotta have a policy-driven uh, approach from the governor's office. You're not getting it from uh, uh, Rick Perry, you're not going to give it uh, get it from uh, Greg Abbott, who doesn't even tell us what he views, what he's going to do about education, transportation, and water. Where's the beef, Greg? I mean, it's not there. There's no substance to this guy. All right, let's leave it there, uh, Chairman Pawkin. Thank you very much for your willingness to answer these questions. Appreciate it.